Okay, with that already said, uh, recording in progress, uh, say something about the meaning of that. Uh, I mean, what that, you know, you know the meaning of that, but the, uh, what that implies in a, in a, in a second. Uh, but first of all, welcome everybody. My name is Matthias Risse. I'm the director of the CAR Center for Human Rights Policy. Um, and I'm delighted uh, to be here today in a conversation with Rabbi David Wolpe, whom I will introduce to you uh, in, a, in a moment uh, a little bit more extensively than just by mentioning his name. Uh, but just in terms of the recording, so uh, this event uh, will be recorded just to make this conversation, the exchange here, available to people who uh, cannot be in the room with us today. Uh, and what this means for the way we will engage in questions later, we want to give you opportunities to ask questions the usual way, which means you introduce yourself, you ask a question. But since we are recording, we will also give you these two other options of asking questions, namely to just ask your question, not introduce yourself. Uh, or alternatively, a third option is if you don't want to be even uh, on the recording with your voice, the camera will only be on us, but your voice would obviously be on it. But you can also uh, send a question to Maggie Gates uh, and uh, on email, uh, and she will uh, relay the question then to us without uh, mentioning any name. Uh, and Maggie's email is mgates, so uh, gates as the plural of gate, uh, gates with an m, mgates at uh, hks.harvard.edu. Uh, you can ask those, you can see these, uh, send these questions to Maggie anytime also while, uh, while we are uh, still uh, talking here. Uh, so by way of uh, setting the stage uh, for this uh, conversation, we just entered uh, the month of April. Uh, which is the uh, the last month of the teaching part uh, of the spring semester, which in turn is the second semester in what uh, turned out to be a year rather different uh, from what we thought it would be at the beginning of the academic year. So it's been a difficult year for all of us in different ways. Uh, some of you in this room are intimately connected <coughs> to the situation. Some of you are connected to people who are intimately connected. Uh, all of you have been here, have been involved in discussions about these things. So it's uh, it's been uh, it's been difficult after uh, the Hamas attacks on uh, on Israel on October seventh. Subsequent uh, response by the Israeli army, the invasion of the Gaza area, ongoing still. Obviously, uh, Harvard University has made a lot of headlines uh, in uh, in recent months. Really, right from the uh, from the beginning, uh, when uh, the way the university had chosen to handle uh, the situation came up for a lot of criticisms. Uh, there uh, there have been accusations. Uh, of anti-Semitism and anti-Islamophobia. They have been very common. There have been lots of acts of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. We remember the doxing trucks. Uh, we remember a number of individual acts reported in the press. Uh, we obviously remember the resignation of a president uh, at some point, uh, then with a lot of accompanying uh, events. Uh, we have also seen a lot of events around campus dealing with the situation. So there have been a lot of conversations, a lot of centers, a lot of individual faculty members have tried to um, live up to the situation in the different parts of the, uh, of the university. Very different things happen in different parts of the university. Uh, the car center has done a number of things uh, over the years, over the, over the month, various other uh, places at the Kennedy School also have uh, different activities at other uh, parts of Harvard University. So, uh, so we, uh, we have tried to deal with the situation also within the limits of capacities of, uh, of this particular university. Um, what I'm seeing now as the year is, uh, as this academic year, the teaching part is coming to an end is um, by way of Kind of, um, uh, characterizing the situation also as a starting point for our conversation here. Um, let me mention two things that I'm seeing. One thing that I'm seeing is um, people who have lived around Harvard Square, have spent time around Harvard Square, have experienced this whole period of time very differently. It is uh, uh, quite curious, actually, to talk to people who have lived in a different part of the social uh, in a different part of the social nexus of, of Harvard University, how they have experienced the realities of anti-Semitism, uh, Islamophobia, what has happened to them, what they have heard, how they have processed these events. It has, I think, a lot to do with um, 
whom you're spending time with, whom you're hanging out with, with whom you are exchanging ideas. It also, I think, has a lot to do with the fact of which physical bit of the campus you're inhabiting, what you are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, what you are, what you are, where you are passing, yeah, what you are noticing. Uh, but then also we were just talking about this earlier, you know, how is, how is this going at the Divinity School? How is it going at the Kennedy School? So the different institutional parts of Harvard, the different institutional components of Harvard have uh, have gone through very uh, different trajectories in, uh, in in recent times. And, uh, and and that leads to this curious situation that, you know, if you get in a conversation as of April 3rd with somebody who is at a, located differently on Harvard campus, then it feels like even though we have always been in a proximity of roughly one mile of each other this whole time uh, we have inhabited almost different worlds you know so that is that is one thing uh, that I see uh, another thing that I see is that uh, even though there's this broad diversity of uh, experiential viewpoints that uh, that people have had there's also just a lot of aggregative statements that people make so Harvard University is this Harvard University does that Harvard University is anti-semitic Harvard University is Islamophobic Harvard University is definitely not anti-Semitic at all. Harvard University is definitely not Islamophobic at all. So there are these macro statements uh, about which, um, you know, me speaking as a philosopher, one could say, well, what are even what are the truth conditions here for that? Yeah, what what must the world be like for it to make sense of a university with this complexity as Harvard to say it as a whole is either that or not that or the other thing, right? So what does this have to be like? And nonetheless, we see a lot of that and we see a lot of that in the press. We see a lot of that in social media. Um, I've been involved in, you know, in a, you know, quite a number of media inquiries and also visiting journalists. And I've often wondered uh, whether them visiting was a good use of anybody's time, because it seems often what they wrote is something they had set out in their mind to write anyway, even before they came here. And a lot of people would just want to be seen to say and write th certain things about Harvard University. So it's become quite a quite a genre uh, to do uh, to to do that. So that's 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 what I'm what I'm seeing and. Uh, that's my starting point for uh, for for this um, for this conversation, which um, in a way makes it harder because of all this complexity. But I think once one sees this complexity, maybe that also uh, you know makes it easier to find a way in, just to kind of you know un understand that people come from from all these uh, different viewpoints. But with all that said, I am delighted here today uh, to be here with uh, Rabbi, Rabbi David Wolpe, who's one of the most visible and influential rabbis in the United States. In fact, one could say he's a bit of a rock star rabbi. So we are tremendously uh, lucky to have him here, not just uh, here today uh, with us, but uh, the university, I think, is very lucky uh, to have him here. I um, spend quite a lot of time in, in recent weeks catching up on all the fascinating conversations and addresses that uh, one finds of, of David out there. And I've uh, learned a lot uh, from from just listening uh, to the to the fountain of insight and uh, information and wisdom that 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 comes from you um, david and and especially on the subject of anti-semitism so if you you know the one thing that you you might want to do is also as a as homework from from this meeting david has an absolutely fascinating 45 minute talk about the history of anti-semitism and just to to have things in perspective in historical in this historical view is just uh, is just tremendous was just for me was tremendous enlightening uh, so Rabbi Wolpe just stepped down after 25 years from the leadership of uh, Sinai Temple in uh, in LA and my first question actually for him will be for for those of us less initiated than others to tell us a little bit about what the work at uh, Sinai Temple was like and uh, and he is now a visiting scholar here at the at the Divinity School and has been also quite a presence and you know as in, in in these debates about anti-semitism on um, on on campus so it's a visiting scholar here also serves as the inaugural rabbinic fellow for the anti-defamation league so it's very much in, in engaged in um, in this nexus so first of all please uh, give him a round of applause <laughs> David, just by way of just bringing you in the starting the conversation with you, could you tell us a little bit about the what work, what about the nature of the work of at uh, Sinai Temple in LA, the, what the congregation a little bit, and the transition you made to the other coast? Then, so uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, so I I'm not a, an entire stranger to the East Coast, and both my parents came from Boston. Um, so it's a little bit of a homecoming. I all of a sudden discovered all these relatives I had no idea that I had, um, which is always uh, 
blessing. Um, so, uh, they're very nice. Um, and and uh, I, I was saying to Matthias right before this that people have, have said, oh my God, this is such a difficult year, such a stressful year. And I said, it's so much easier than being the rabbi of a synagogue. Um, because I, the truth is being the rabbi of a synagogue is unbelievably rewarding, but it's stressful for the same reason that it's rewarding, which is you're responsible for the life and the emotions and the grief and the joy of many, many, many families. I had like 1,500, 1,600 families in my synagogue, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending. Um, and, uh, and that's about 5,000 people, all of whom have the presumptive right to call you at any moment because you are their rabbi. Uh, and so it's really wonderful. And you do feel like you're, I, I, it's a very strange thing if you think about it. The wedding is that you have this family unit that have known each other forever and ever and ever and are very close, but the pivotal person at that ceremony is actually someone that you don't know that well and who may not know you that well, but at that moment, they're part of the family because you have to have the rabbi at the wedding or the funeral or whatever. So you're very close to people and yet at the same time outside. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating thing to do with one's life and I'm glad that I did it. And uh, I still go back once a month or so to my congregation um, or a little bit less and, and I'm still tied to them, but I also, uh, I'm really happy to have uh, a chance to do something else. Um, the other thing that was interesting, particularly about my congregation, is that about 50 to 60 percent of them were uh, from Iran. They were Iranian Jews. They left in 79, 80, most of them, when the Shah fell and Ayatollah Khomeini took over. Um, and that gave a very different feel to the congregation and a very different sort of population. And, and what happens, of course, is that you learn when you have to become close to families, you get to learn a lot about their experience and their culture that otherwise you wouldn't know. And so my experience was atypical. I just want to, I'll, I'll close with this anecdote before the next, just because I, I, I think about this often. When I was in rabbinical school, I had a professor who was like the dean of conservative, I'm, I'm part of the conservative movement. There's orthodox conservative reform. I'm the middle. It's not, not related to political conservative here. It's just called conservative. But anyway, he was the dean of conservative rabbis in in America, and he was in his 90s when he taught his last class, and I was in his last class. And his name was Simon Greenberg. And he said to us, your job as a rabbi in America is, and I don't care how anybody else would finish that sentence, you won't finish it the way he did. He said, your job as a rabbi in America is to explain America to your congregants. And I thought to myself, well, that was your job because you were a rabbi to a nation of immigrants. And so you had to tell them, you know, all these people whose native language was Yiddish, it wasn't English, and they didn't know anything about America, and you did, so you had to teach them about it. So it's not gonna be my job, because my congregants are all gonna be Americans. And then I go to Los Angeles, and half my congregation are immigrants. And I'm thinking somewhere, Simon Greenberg is looking down at me and saying, uh -huh, you see, you had no idea what your life was gonna be like. Um, so it was a, a fascinating and wonderful thing. And then uh, I got the chance to come here and uh, that's also been fascinating and, and often wonderful. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me ask you one other thing before sure. moving on to that, uh, the larger subject of uh, anti-Semitism. So one thing that I've found incredibly refreshing when listening uh, to you and the, the various videos that I've seen, you have a very upbeat take on the role of faith in politics. So for you, faith is a unifying force in politics, which is refreshing <laughs> because it's so different from the usual appeals to more divisive attitudes in that domain. Could you elaborate sure. for us a little bit about the unifying force? I tried very hard in my pulpit not to take political positions and instead to stress the emotional and spiritual components that actually people on different sides of the political spectrum had in common. So, and, and part of the reason that I did this was because I had a politically a very divided congregation. And I mean, really divided. I had on an average Saturday morning, 
I would say a majority of the people who were there on the west side of LA voted for Trump, which on the west side of LA is not what you expect, but the Persian community tends to be much more conservative. And so I had to actually learn why people viewed the world the way they did instead of making caricatures of them and making my assumption about why they viewed the world the way they did. And I saw how many of their fundamental desires were the same. They just really thought that the mechanisms of the other side were not the way they were going to get there. Um, I mean, I know Jonathan Haidt's work, and I know that he says conservatives and liberals have different value structures. But I have to say, when you're in a congregation, the, the problem that we have with politics is that we have no common culture. So I don't know what books you've read, and you don't know what books I've read, and we don't know if we've gone to the same movies. I mean, like, Barbie was such a big movie because everybody went. And for a second, we could say, oh, almost everyone you know went to one movie or another. Um, <coughs> but when you don't have a common culture, the only thing you have in common is politics. And so every, every discussion starts with that, which is guaranteed to divide people before they realize what they have in common. But when you live in a faith community, you have kids in school and meals that you make and, 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 and bedtimes and summer camp and struggles with teenagers and how, how parents deal with dating and how, te in other words, all the stuff of life, which is where we live actually 80 to 85% of the time, maybe more. And that's actually what ties people together, but they don't talk about that. Instead, they talk about political divisions first, and then it's very hard to vault over and get to the personal stuff. So for me, faith is a much more, it's not that faith has nothing to say to society in general, of course it does, but it starts in the individual heart and home. And if you start there, you have a much better chance of actually having a cohesive um, community and country than if we start with, well, are you a, a Republican or a Democrat? Um, so so let's, um, let's start talking about anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism is a, is a heavy duty word in our political vocabulary. Um, and so we, you know, needs to be characterized and in a way policed very carefully because, you know, once you have that, right? So anti-Semitism basically to accuse somebody of anti-Semitism, basically you put them, in my mind, I see images of concentration camps. I right. see images of Auschwitz. I see Nazis and I see Nazi efforts. So to, to, to diagnose anti-Semitism in a person, in an attitude, in a statement means they are basically in that corner. So we want to be careful thinking about what it, what it means. We want to do justice uh, to it. And the way this has shaped up in the, in the debate, there's, uh, there's, there's also various proposed definitions. And the way they differ is in terms of uh, what the in terms of what to make of criticisms of Israeli governmental policies, you know, what the connection is between anti-Semitism and Israeli governmental policies. And on the one hand, we have a view that thinks of anti-Semitism as a version of visceral hatred of Jews, such that criticism of the state of Israel is just something completely different, right? So we need to keep these things apart. And in the car center context, we have had conversations with two people uh, this semester who very much stood for that way of thinking. And one of them was, was here earlier this week, Derek Penzler, uh, who is you know very much behind one version of this understanding of anti-Semitism. And earlier this semester, Peter Weinart also is in very much in that camp. Anti-Semitism is one thing. Uh, criticism of Israel is another thing. Then there's another definition and another account of the school of thought about anti-Semitism that, uh, that brings these things much closer together. And I see you more there, David. And one, one rationale for that, one very straightforward rationale for that that I, that I see certainly uh, is these days a lot of visceral hatred against Jews is basically camouflaging itself finds an outlet in criticisms of Israel. And I have heard, often heard you talk about this in terms of Venn diagrams. You say, yes, it's quite possible to make, to, to make criticism of Israel. In fact, you have emphasized strongly that Israel is known for having a very 
vibrant public sphere. You know, Israelis are the most outspoken critics of the government of Israel, and there's no problem for you in uh, in uh, in in acknowledging and engaging with criticism of Israel without uh, characterizing it as anti-Semitic. But you also you do th you do seem to think that there's a lot of overlap there, and so you seem to be more. I think I've heard you say, said once, day in a way, until proven different, one should think that a criticism of Israel depends is... Depends what kind of criticism. I wouldn't yeah. say, right, if, if somebody says, you know, geez, that tax policy in Israel is really awful, I wouldn't say until proven otherwise, you know, they're obviously anti-Semitic. Um, <laughs> but, but here's, I, this, is a, this is obviously a complicated issue, and no single answer does justice to it. I, I think that that's true, like all really difficult questions, you know? Um, but I, this is the way, at least I think of it. I don't think of it the way either Peter or Derek do. Um, and I've had dialogues with Peter. I have one actually on, on, on Friday. Um, uh, but, uh, but I think that they're wrong, frankly. And I'll tell you why. Um, it is certainly possible, it is possible to dislike Israel and have no feeling about Jews. It's possible. The reason that I'm suspicious that it is common, and I think that it's in fact fairly uncommon, is this. First of all, um, I don't think thinking Israel's policies are terrible or saying even that Israel committed genocide is by itself anti-Semitic. I certainly don't think that. Um, I may disagree with that characterization, but I don't think saying that is anti-Semitic. Saying Israel shouldn't exist Starts, starts the following chain of thought in my mind, and you can take it as you will. I think, okay, here's a person who knows, for example, that Germany started two world wars that almost destroyed the world, but never says Germany shouldn't exist. Knows that the Sudan displaced seven million people, but never says the Sudan shouldn't exist. Knows that Syria killed 600,000 of their own people, doesn't say Syria shouldn't exist knows that China puts the Uyghurs in real concentration camps and has been doing it for a long time and forces Chinese uh, forces Uyghur women to have children with Chinese men because they don't have because of the one child policy doesn't say China shouldn't exist the only place that shouldn't exist among 27 Arab countries 30 plus Muslim countries is the only Jewish country in the world now if that were true about a group that didn't have thousands of years of persecution behind it, I might say, hmm, maybe that's a coincidence. But given that in the lifetime of people who are still alive, a third of all the Jews in the world were killed, given that in both Muslims and Christian lands, Jews suffered persecution for thousands of years, to all of a sudden say, no, that's the one place that really doesn't deserve to exist, makes me doubt very much that this is a purely geopolitical uh, conclusion. I think that it has something to do with anti-Semitism in most cases, when people are actually arguing against the existence of Israel. And the other piece of evidence that seems to me to be pretty sound on this is the images and the language that are used by the people who want Israel off. You constantly see swastikas. You constantly see Nazi language referring only, only to Jewish, right, to the IDF, not to any other army in the world. Um, you constantly hear how Israel is uniquely evil among states. You look at the UN, you get 80 resolutions condemning countries in the world for bad behavior. 75 of them are anti-Israel. So I, I think that it is naive to believe that a lot, a lot of the rhetoric uh, behind the eliminationism of Israel doesn't have at least an anti-Semitic spring or core. It may not be purely anti-Semitic, but I think that there, it's, it's there. It's just there. Yeah. Okay, so but, but this was... This response was now very much focused on this particular viewpoint that Israel shouldn't exist. Right. And I think a, a lot of people in this on this broader camp of these definitions would say, yeah, that is that is hard to make sense of other than in terms of anti-Semitism. 
Uh, but the, the genocide example is actually quite interesting. So I'm surprised that you say that because this always struck me, you know, if, if one believes that that there is this large overlap between uh, anti-Semitic attitudes and criticism of Israel. So typically then the positions that would come up for a strong suspicion of anti-Semitism is to think of what's happening in the Gaza area currently as a genocide, is to think of the occupation policies as apartheid, is to speak in support of a boycott of Israel or you know other kind of sanctioning. So, so all, all of so, these are right. more typically characterized. So what I would say, what I would say is, I'm trying to be as careful as possible because, as you said, anti-Semitism is the nuclear weapon. Yeah. It's like racism. It's like as soon as you are that, you know that you are outside of decent discourse. Yeah. And the reason that I said that is, I look, I can imagine someone seeing the images from Gaza and heartbreaking as they are to anybody who has a heart to be broken and and feeling like genocide just means something truly horrible and terrible is going on. And I can't expect somebody to have the level of interest and involvement and knowledge about it that you do or I do. So that doesn't automatically make me think that somebody is anti-Semitic. Um, and and I would say that the there is still a Venn diagram, but the overlap is a lot less one to one than it is for somebody who says that Israel shouldn't exist. Um, so I'm more careful. Like if somebody says to me, um, if somebody says to me, uh, I think Israel's an apartheid state or I think it's genocide. I want to engage that person in a dialogue to see why they've drawn those conclusions and how much they know about it and so on before I'm ready to to launch accusations against them. Okay. Okay. So if somebody if somebody stood out there and and said, I think uh, let's say, let's let's just ignore what's been happening this year, just to kind of you know not okay. not engage. Right. But if a year ago, two years ago, somebody would have said to you. Uh, I'm a supporter of various boycotts against Israel because I want there to be an ethical way of resisting, of, of showing solidarity with the Palestinians against occupation policies. I want to know. And then, and then somebody and said. What's your, and what's your end goal in doing that? Yeah. So, but let me finish. The, if, then somebody said, and that, that attitude is anti-Semitic. I, I want to know what their end goal is in supporting those boycotts. Okay. If they say, I support a boycott because I think that's the best way to get to a peaceful two-state solution. I will say to them, I think actually you're you're foolish and short-sighted and you don't know what you're talking about. But, be anti -Semitic. but it wouldn't necessarily be anti-Semitic depending on the variety that they want, if they want to boycott all of Israel, I think that's pretty. If they say I want to boycott those territories that I think should eventually be a Palestinian state, again, I think it's it's oh. foolish, it's short-sighted, it could be anti-Semitic, but I would not automatically make the conclusion that it is. No. Okay. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about um, what's happening right now, the changes in anti-Semitism. I know that's been a lot right. on your mind, so I. I have heard you say things like, so, you know, living, being Jewish in the United States is still a good thing. And I like your line on that because, you know, here Jewish people are blending in as right. one group among many others. You're not like the others, right. you know, compared to other locations exactly. where, where Jews have lived. And you, and, you, and you say this is still the case, which I think is a nice, nicely reassuring message in, in these right. troubled times. But you have also, you have a very interesting thought about why we are seeing such strong flaring up of anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, the whole, the whole range of attitudes. And, uh, and if I understood this correctly, I think what, what, you, what you said about that is there's a kind of a generational reckoning with the West, right? that right. the West is perceived to be you know, in need of some kind of rectification, chastising, and you know, we have to we have to do a reckoning with the colonial history. So the, these associations with colonialism they are quite common, and Israel is basically kind of run together. And you think, which you think is by and large a good thing that it's in in the West, right. but it's therefore also coming. It's it's taken to task for a general reckoning. With is this this roughly how you explain yes. this? So so I'll. I'll, I'll... I'll put it in, in the following way. Um, there is, I think that there's, 
there's a sort of return of the repressed ideologically. That is, for a long time, everybody said how wonderful the West was, and the West was great, and the West was this, and the West was that. And we didn't really tell our whole story. And I think younger people see that we didn't tell our whole story. And, and I've quoted before this, this wonderful line from Sartre uh, in his book, The Words, which is, like all dreamers, I confuse disillusion with truth. That is, when you're disillusioned about something, you think, oh, that disillusionment is the truth. And so I think you have now a generation that actually, while they see the warts of the West and what it's done wrong, they don't see the unbelievable achievements and virtues and merits of the West. And in fact, they don't compare it. It's, it's a weird kind of almost racism in that when they look at other parts of the world, they don't apply the same standards to other parts of the world that they do to the West. Right now, for example, in the Arab and Muslim world, there are m tens of millions of slaves, right? Mauritania is, is practically built on slavery. And yet nobody says, well, look, they're, they're, the West is actually the one place that eliminated slavery. And obviously it was a horrible blight on our history and so on. But look at all these places that still have slaves. How terrible is that? Not a protest. Not a, not a word. I've never seen a sign being carried about it. It says if it doesn't exist, but you can Google it very easily. Just look at slavery around the world and you will get horrific statistics. And so what happens is that if somebody is associated with the West, they get judged according to the standards of the West and fall short of it without people realizing that what you're doing is actually applying the standards of the West to the West. Um, and and this and the definition now of being evil is colonial settlerism, which basically is the creation of the West, which had a great deal of evil in it. I don't think anybody can um, can gainsay that. But they, Israel is thrown in, in addition to the anti-Semitic part, to this brew, and Israel doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the colonial settler pattern for a couple of reasons. One is colonialists are people who come from one place and take over another. Um, is, Israel came from Israel. I mean, it was kicked out a long time ago, but that's where it came from. It's not like it comes from France and goes to Algeria, and once Algeria kicks it out, everybody goes back to France. There's nowhere to go back to. That's one. Second is colonial settlers in, in Western parlance are associated with white people. If you go to Israel, you will discover that more than half of Israel is what we call people of color. Um, that is from Arab lands, from Ethiopia, and white people in Israel are actually a minority, not a majority. And then the third reason is colonialists take a land in order to exploit its resources. That's what colonialists do. That's why we got South Africa is a perfect example, right? It was about exploiting all the resources of South Africa not to live there and raise families and make it a home because you consider it a national home. That's not what colonialists do, right? That might be, and, 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 the, and, the, uh, and the other thing, by the way, the colonialists don't do is give back land once they have it. But the Sinai was almost as big as Israel that they gave back to Egypt in order to make peace. And, uh, and, and this is my sort of fundamental argument with the conflict as it stands is anybody who follows the history of Israel knows the one way you make peace with Israel is to say, I want to make peace with you. It worked for Jordan. It worked for Egypt. It worked for the UAE. It worked for all the Abraham Accord countries. You just have to say, I want to make peace with you. But if tomorrow, and this is a little bit of a rant, not exactly to your point, but if tomorrow the Israelis had the firepower of the Palestinians, and the Palestinians had the firepower of the Israelis. How many Jews do you think would be left in, in Israel by the end of the week? Um, that question is a question I have never heard somebody satisfactorily answer. And so we're not dealing with the same sort of dynamic that we are dealing with when we deal with other colonialist endeavors and powers. This is not King Leopold in Belgium, in Israel. It's something completely different. Yep. Let's, um, let's get closer to home, uh, anti-Semitism uh, at Harvard. So, you know, one thing that I myself often thought when I heard these aggregate statements about Harvard as a whole being anti-Semitic, 
you know, as opposed to anti-Semitic incidents happening to people, which you know I I know happened, and you know I can think of numerous cases where you know it was either news or people shared it with me. So I have no contest on that. But you know the aggregate statements of Harvard, where I'm wondering, you know, what what is the, what is the truth condition for that? Right, that Harvard as a whole would be anti-Semitic. And one thing that I've often thought then. If you look at the leadership of the university, you know, if you count the current interims president right. as a president, then something like four of the last six presidents have been Jewish. Yeah. Multiple deans are Jewish. You know, so in, in my kind of hierarchical experience of Harvard, Jews are very strongly represented. Yes. Also among the student population, you know, there's various there's various numbers that I've seen about how the student, the Jewish student, the share of the Jewish student population is declining, but Overall, it is still way overrepresented vis-a-vis -vis the share in the population. So then I've always thought, why, why would it possibly, how could it possibly make sense to say at the aggregate that Harvard is anti-Semitic? But I've actually heard you say something now that actually speaks to that directly in very illuminating ways, namely in your historical understanding of anti-Semitism. What you say is anti-Semitism, the mechanisms of that have actually always been driven by two things. So one thing, Jews were there as a as a recognizable group, so they were not they were not like one or two. There was actually a recognizable group, so they could be targeted, right? And they were sufficiently small to be bullied right. and victimized, so not not a huge group. But then the other thing uh, that you added to that is they also played important roles in society, right? right. So their dedication, commitment to education meant they, you yeah. know, their cohesiveness socially right. meant they were successful. So it was this combination of small size, and so which then of course would fit the Harvard. Example it, perfectly. It does, it so does because, yeah. because anti Semitism is almost always a conspiracy theory, yeah. which isn't true for other hatreds. People don't look at, at other groups that they hate and say, I hate them because they run the world, or they control the banks, or they run the media, or on and on and on, or, or in LA because the Jews created Hollywood and, and they run every, all the movies, right? But, but, Jew, but anti-Semitism is almost always a conspiracy theory because Jews are a very small number. I mean, Jews are like 0.2% of the world, which is nothing. Where 2% of the United States, less than 2%, like 1.8% of the United States is Jewish. That's it. But since they've been a successful minority group, the hatred must be, ah, there is this secret cabal that ties them all together that really ultimately runs the world like the protocols of the elders of Zion or, you know, the Rothschilds are really behind the space lasers, um, just to choose uh, an example. Um, so what ha I would, I mean, I, I also, I agree. I would never say something like Harvard is anti-Semitic. Um, I think to, to label institutions that broadly with, rare exceptions is, you know, is, is not helpful. Um, but I do think that there has been a great deal of anti-Semitism expressed at Harvard and unmonitored, well, oh, it's been monitored by the Jewish community, but um, unrebuked, let me put it that way, unrebuked. Um, the administration hasn't rebuked it. People have clearly violated the laws of Harvard over and over and over again, and nothing has happened. Um, and there is this sense, although I know that I had a discussion, I've had a discussion with now more than one president, both of whom don't believe that this is true, but I'm not sure that I agree with them. There is this sense that if the same kind of discrimination happens to another group, the response would be swift and certain. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I mean, Steven Pinker has, has put it this way. He said, you know, you can, you can get thrown out of the place for misgendering someone, but for calling them baby killers, nobody cares. Um, and, and there is, and while that is the kind of like easy bromide that is, uh, but it's true. <laughs> That's what's happened this year. I mean, there was a student who was, who was threatened with a, uh, a, a, a machete on his, uh, what do you call the Slack channels? Not the Slack channel, but whatever it is. And that employee who threatened him still works here. And I cannot imagine that that would happen to anybody other than a Jewish student. Um, so, yeah, I think that it has been very, I, I, I want to also, I'll give Harvard this, <laughs> this Slack um, on this channel. Uh, <laughs> one thing that, 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 President Garber has said, which is a really important point, is I think worth remembering. That is, universities are set up 
to discipline students who are protesting against universities. Every other protest has been against Harvard in one way or another, right? And so you have a very light footprint because you don't want to come down too heavy on students that are protesting against Harvard. It looks bad. This is the first time they've had where, first instance they've had where students are protesting against another group of students. And the, that a little bit took, caught the university flat-footed. They weren't quite ready for that before. Um, but I still think that there's something about the, and, and part of it is anti-Semitism, and part of it is this perception that Jews aren't vulnerable. But anybody who has the most elementary knowledge of history knows that that's ridiculous. And if you look, I, I don't know, I mean, some of you will be familiar and some not, but just look at the FBI crime statistics. Forget the ADL. Look at the FBI hate crime statistics. Against Jews, they are like multiple percentages higher than against any other single group. Um, and, and you have to ask yourself, why is that so? Uh, and the only answer that I can come up with, since also I have thousands of years of history behind it, is that there is a, a hard anti-Semitism that is baked into Western society. Look, I'm gonna say something, this is a very hard thing to hear, but it's also true. Uh, Eliezer Berkowitz, who was a Jewish theologian, said, it is true that many of the Nazis were not Christians. Many of them were, right? He said, it is true that many of the Nazis were not Christians, but what is also true is that every Nazi was the child of a Christian. Christianity has within it and has had within it for a very long time evil tropes about Jews and anti-Semitism and being Christ killers and being evil. And many of those tropes now are very, very, very popular in the Muslim world. So one of the things that I, uh, I was on a podcast with Sam Harris, and he was talking about someone whom we both know, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who grew up in Somalia, okay? And this is what she said. She said, growing up, I never met a Jew. And I never met anyone who met a Jew, but I knew Jews were evil. Now, that kind of pervasive sense of the evil of a people, it's really hard to grow up in that atmosphere and not have it, I mean, you have to almost be deprogrammed. And so there's a lot of that at Harvard, um, way too much of it. And, and I think that calling attention to it is incredibly important because it needs to be addressed. Let me ask you one follow-up to that and then I'm gonna open up to the audience questions. So um, so just rocking with this characterization of, of anti-Semitism is fueled by these two conditions, right? Well, it'd be a small group, but also you know, visible, prominent, and so in a way leading to these conspiracy theories, kind of a worthy right. goal of attack, right? Um, so if I'm, if I'm thinking about this from the point of view of university administration, I think about what kind of protections my students need, our students need, and what groups come up for special need for protection. And I'm thinking about it, as, and this was often done, right, since right. diversity, equity, inclusion came into this debate, and yeah, right. why is this this way, and, you know, with Jews is that way. Yeah. So one thing that I would see when I'm looking at my university community, I would see my African-American students, and I would, I, for one thing, I would see in terms of they are not overrepresented, right? right. They are barely, rep, they're barely, you know, at, right. the, at the level of the population, if they are anywhere near. They are definitely very thinly represented in the in, among. So the, so the higher you go, the less you know are they represented. And of course, we still live in a society where they are really not getting you know getting places economically and politically. So so as a university administrator, I would say that is why people of color, African Americans in particular, need special protection. And you are, and I could say you are right about everything that you said about the, the, the particular history of hatred against Jews. Yes, but that doesn't mean they need special protection quite the same way because of this condition that you identified, that they're actually doing well in representation at the university. They have the deans, they have the presidents, and you could think they watch out for them more than they have traditionally right. watched out. So this is a complicated question. I have a lot of thoughts on it, and I'm going to try to, to, to be uh, concise. Um, first of all, there, there is no question that um, it's not a question of protection as much uh, uh, for African-American students, because African-American students are not, to my, at least 
from what I've seen so far at Harvard and other places, they're not being assaulted, insulted, accused. It is a question of aid to African-American students so that they can like get their foot on the ladder and be part of this is, and, and to me, by the way, so much of this is what the, the seek, part of the secret of, of achieving something in this world is being in the room where other people are achieving it. Like so much is who you know. And so what you have to do is get underrepresented minorities in the room where they can get to know the other people. Like I, I and I'll give you from my own experience, um, I said to my daughter at a show, cause I was the rabbi of a, this congregation in LA and I was a rabbi in LA. And I remember saying to my daughter when she was going off to college, I know that I know how obnoxious this sounds, but it's also true. I said to her, I want you to know whatever field you're interested in, we're going to know somebody who can give you some kind of entree into that field of work. And that's an unbelievable advantage for a child to have, right? But that's what you want everybody to have. And so that's the kind of help that I think underrepresented minorities African-Americans and others really need is they just need to be in the room so that they can know the same people that all of us know or th that you get when you're at Harvard. Because if, just by being at Harvard, you're going to know people who are going to go on to do unbelievable things and you're going to know them and you'll be able to pick up the phone and say, you know, hey, Joe, at the, who runs the IRS now, why am I getting audited? And they'll say, oh, I'll help you, Frank. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but maybe not. Um, it's Harvard after all. That's different from the kinds of protections that I think Jewish students need. I'm not saying you have to have affirmative action for Jewish students so that they can get into the colleges. There was a time when there were quotas. I don't think that's the issue now. The issue now is that there are serious, I, I mean, look, Danielle Allen said it. Um, she said, I wouldn't send my kid to a school where people were going around yelling white power because it creates a hostile atmosphere and I wouldn't want my kid to have to deal with that when they were trying to go to college. I want my kid to go to a college where people are going around and saying Jews are baby killers. I mean, that's, that's a different kind of protection. So the question about DEI, which is a really complicated and I think really important one, aside, I, I'm not, I, I see these as different issues. And then by the way, there's another issue of class, which we don't talk about very much. But if a kid comes, if the kid is the first kid in his or her family to go to college and they come, I don't know, from Appalachia and they walk into Harvard's campus, they need a lot of help too. They really do. They don't, I mean, all the things that people whose parents and grandparents went to college take for granted, they don't take for granted. And it doesn't matter what the color of their skin is. They still, so there are multiple different kinds of ways that different groups need help or protection and also individuals. And I don't want to, I don't want to enmesh all of them together because they're not, I don't think they're the same. So uh, three ways of asking questions, the old fashioned way, uh, introducing yourself, ask your question. Uh, the first alternative to that is to just ask your question if you don't want your name recorded. Uh, the third possibility is to send a question uh, to um, mgates uh, at uh, hks.harvard.edu. Any questions? I start in the back there and then I go to Barack. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I'm Siu. I'm a fellow at the Center for International Development. I wanted to understand better why would you say it's short-sighted to try to have a two-state solution, and I wanted to understand a bit more of your perspective on that. Thank you. No, I don't. I actually don't think it's short-sighted to want to have a two-state solution. I was talking about BDS as a means to get there. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people. I know that a lot of people. I still hold out hope for a two-state <laughs> solution, um, but I don't think that Israel's willingness is the, is the obstacle to a two-state solution. Um, I, I mean, I will lay my cards on the table, although some people will object to this, but as long as you ask. Um, unfortunately, and I, I actually think that Fareed Zakaria might have put his finger on it, oil wealth has prevented a lot of Arab states from developing a political culture that other states, I mean, 
30 years ago, South Korea and Singapore and, and, and Saudi Arabia were all in the same boat. But South Korea and Singapore didn't have oil. They didn't have an easy means. So they had to develop a political culture that was much more sophisticated. And now they're thriving as states. The Arab states have not done that. So I ask sometimes Palestinians who talk about creating a Palestinian state, what do you want to model it after? Iraq, Iran, Syria, Lebanon? I mean, it's not as though there are examples in the Arab world of the kind of states that you would want to put your state next to, right? I mean, if, if, if Yemen came along and said, we want to be in Mexico, how do you think the United States would react to that? So what I really want, I want like a reformation in the Arab world. And it's obviously can be, I mean, we all know that there was a time when Islam was the most advanced culture in the world. Then it lapsed for whatever complicated historical reasons. And, and I want to see that again, because I really do believe that if that were possible, that the Middle East could be an unbelievable engine for goodness and for change. But unfortunately, so far, um, that's really hard to see. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, so I'm uh, Barack Sella. I'm a mid-career MPA student at the Kennedy School. Um, I do a lot of interviews, unfortunately, since uh, the war started, and mostly to Israeli media, people trying to understand how anti-Semitism looks at Harvard. And I try to explain, no one's throwing rocks at Jews, right? But I'll give an example that happened to me last week. So last week I went to a study group about the uh, democracy in India and different laws that they're doing there. And we're specifically talking about the civil act there that is changing the registry and potentially stripping citizenship from Muslim uh, Indian citizens. And we had a conversation. I went because as a pro-democracy activist in Israel, I wanted to learn about democracy in other countries. Um, at a certain point in the conversation, one of the students says, oh, this is exactly the same uh, laws that they're doing in Israel, and ironically, it, that they did in Nazi Germany. Mm. So one of the students, an Israeli student, said, well, maybe can this conversation be about India? We came to a study group about India. And they were like, no, we need to do this. Uh, I want to talk about this. I tried to respond by asking, what laws are you talking about exactly? And the only thing I got was Israel is an apartheid state. So when I tried to refute that, I was shut down very aggressively. Um, and I stayed quiet because I didn't want to hijack the very uh, generous uh, uh, facilitator that was trying to lead a study group about India. And that's the experience of many Israelis and Jews on campus. Um, no space is safe. You come to, you want to study, you paid a lot of money to get a degree here. And any situation can become uh, an attack. And um, it's hard to explain why that is anti-Semitism, right? But I felt after that session, uh, and I'm not a person that's easy to push over, and I know when I felt uh, bullied or marginalized, and that's how I felt. Now, the question is, how do we recognize that? And how do we, uh, what's the best way to, to, to minimize that, to fight anti-Semitism? And on that end, is it maybe time to start having a conversation the same way we sort of did about racism, admitting the same way we're all sort of indoctrinated with racist tendencies, that everyone is a bit of anti-Semitic. And to admit our anti-Semitism that we are, and to try and deprogram, like you said, because the left is very good at not saying anti-Semitic things overtly, very good at saying the right words. But is there maybe a time that we need to sort of start to uh, have this open conversation that anti-Semitism is something that we all breathe. So if we want to deprogram it, we all have to sort of admit to it. Um, so first of all, I just, in terms of the experience itself, just imagine if you were Russian. I don't think this is happening to Russian students. When Russian students are sitting in class, people don't turn everything into the invasion of Ukraine, which is a, a, a really interesting parallel. Why not? Why not? But why is everything about the invasion of Gaza, which is a very different geopolitical decision, I would argue. But even if you thought it was the same, why is it that Ukraine doesn't have any purchase in the 
it's I, I think that anti-Semitism clearly has a role in that. Um, in terms of everybody admitting that they're a little bit anti-Semitic, um, the difficulty there is not just that I think a lot of people don't believe they are. A lot of people don't believe they are. Um, and and by the way, I, I have an an interesting test if you're but you have to be honest with yourself. When you meet someone and then you hear they're Jewish and you didn't know it at first, does anything shift inside you? And you just have to be honest with whether it does or not. Um, but also, I think that part of this is that the Jewish community itself has been a little slow to want to admit because we were, uh, it's all, I mean, I, I, I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but I will use it. Uh, as a friend of mine says, we've been in remission for 60 years. You know, it's like there was this out, outbreak of anti Semitism, and, and for a while there's been, I mean, I grew up with really very, I mean, I had a couple of incidents of anti-Semitism growing up in Philadelphia, but no, nothing nothing that made me feel like, oh my God, Philadelphia is anti-Semitic. Um, and so I think that the Jewish community is coming to recognize how pervasive it is and what, it, what the effects are, although I still argue, and, and I, let me just make clear what the argument that Matthias was kind enough to quote of mine um, is about, this is why I think America is different, okay? Um, because in all of Jewish history, Jews were the identified other. There were Russians and Jews, there were Germans and Jews, there were Frenchmen and Jews, there were Belgians and Jews, there were Arabs and Jews, there are on and on, Muslims and Jews, Christians and Jews. In America, there aren't Americans and Jews. Americans come in so many different ethnicities, religions, groups, so on and so forth, that it's not like Jews are the identified other. And that's why I think that Jews have done much better in America than they have done elsewhere, and I hope will continue to do so. Um, but it's also why I think it's been, we've been slower to, to feel that um, sense of exclusion that you talk about. So I don't know. I don't know if it's time to, to say that everybody's a little bit anti-Semitic. I don't know if everybody is. Um, I know more people are than I used to think. Yes. Hi, I'm Lily. I have a two-part question. And at the same vein, though, how do you respond to someone who does say, call for the destruction of Israel, you know, they say from the river to the sea, that isn't Jewish, mm -hmm. and then someone who is Jewish, because I feel like those are two very different. Yes, but I respond the same way. Um, I'll tell you, like, my ideal of the way you respond to someone who says that is you ask them lots of questions, because if you want to actually get somebody to think differently, you have to show them that you care how they think. And so I want to know why they've come to that conclusion and what they know about it. And that's true whether they're Jewish or they're not Jewish. I don't want to immediately engage in an argument because I know no one, no one wins that. No one wins that. So, I mean, if you're going to actually engage the person, you really need to know how they've come to that conclusion, what they think about this, what they think about that. It's a long process. Just think about when you've changed your mind, right? It always took the, you know, somebody to really take the time to actually listen to you and to engage with you and all of that. Um, you know, it's, uh, it reminds me of the, um, of, of the family. I, I, I'm, I can't get the details of the story right, but basically the Jew who invited this KKK guy to Shabbos dinner and, and spent a lot of time talking to him. And eventually, by the way, not only did he leave the clan, but the guy eventually converted to Judaism. Um, but that's a labor intensive job. So I think there's no way, but there is no way to make real contact with somebody unless you're willing to listen.
Hi, I'm Zan Grodden. I'm a fellow over at the medical school, and I think we met at uh, the synagogue a couple weekends ago, so it's good to see you again, David. Uh, I have two questions on different subjects. I'll let you guys pick. Do you want a question about uh, state about na national constitutions, or do you want a question about uh, the atmosphere on colleges? That's for both of you. Ask him about constitutions and ask me about colleges. <laughs> Let's deal with the colleges. Yeah. The college question is a quote long ago by Oscar Wilde spoke about he wanted to go to Oxford because of the Oxford manner, the ability to play gracefully with ideas, the ability to separate the personal from the idea, to have disputes, to not make them personal, and to air out differences. That has seemed to fade it, to fade over time. Could you talk about that issue and that erosion of the ability to have these, to play gracefully with, that, gracefully with the ideas um, on college campuses in the US? Um, I think that at least part of the reason that people can't separate the person from the idea is because we have placed so much emphasis on identity, so much. Um, that your ideas are are who you are and who you are are your ideas and the and the notion of a detached reason has suffered a lot by the way i think this is one of the reasons that you get radicalism in the non-hard sciences and the non-mathematical sciences because there you have to have detached reason you can't say two and two is five because i come from this country or that country um but in terms of the humanities the social sciences um any any statement that starts with as a so-and-so I think is a way of asserting that my ideas have a certain currency because of who I am as opposed to the worth of my ideas and I do think that it's incredibly important to return to the notion that idea that the worth of an idea has nothing to do with the person who first espouses it or the passion with which they espouse it right just because I feel strongly about something doesn't make me more likely to be right than something I don't feel strongly about. So uh, I, I, I hope that this, I think that this has been a real awakening for colleges in general. Um, but I, I, this is a malady that has deeply, deeply touched the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, and and I, uh, I hope one day we'll, uh, we'll, um, recede um, from from both but but it's going to take I think it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of work did you want the other question no let me actually I want to just one ask <laughs> you, you know I'll take a rain check on that one <laughs> thank you uh, so let me ask one one concluding question okay, sure. uh, so since you know obviously what's been happening on campus was uh, was uh, you know in a way bad enough but the real tragedy of course is happening on the ground in uh, right. in Gaza and Israel as yes. we speak and do you have any concluding observations what are your thoughts about the situation uh, there uh, at the moment oh boy um again i could talk a lot about it. i I'll, I'll, i would <sighs> it's uh it's an incredibly um it's an incredibly difficult and complicated kind of tragedy, what's going on, uh, because, and, 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 and it may be a prelude, I, I hate to say this to an even greater tragedy, um, because uh, Hezbollah and the rockets that Hezbollah has in the north dwarf the arms that Hamas has in the south, um, and could do enormous, I mean, they could set Tel Aviv on fire God forbid, uh, if they start launching the Hezbollah rockets in the north. Um, and, and it's backed by Iran, who is, I think, the most malign actor in, uh, in the world today, although I do not call for the destruction of the state of Iran. I would just like to point that out. Um, but it is the most malign actor in, in international relations, I believe, in the world. Um, what I would say about Ham the problem, the part of the problem is, you know, Hamas built tunnels all over Gaza, more than the London tube, but not a single bomb shelter. None of the inhabitants of Hamas have. Every Israeli home 
and an institution is built with a bomb shelter. Why? Because the top priority is when bombs fall, you have to protect your civilians. Hamas did the exact opposite. While Hamas fighters are down in tunnels, all the civilians are above. So you have two choices. You cannot kill the Hamas fighters, or you can kill civilians on the way to the Hamas fighters. And that is an awful, absolutely, I mean, it is, it's a dilemma with no moral solution that is like understandable to the human mind. Um, and I believe that if in the end Hamas is left as a standing force, then that two-state solution that we spoke about before recedes even further in, into the background because whatever you think about the actions of the two people, there is no question about the intentions of Hamas. Hamas in its charter calls for the destruction of Jews, not just of, the, of Israel, but of Jews. Um, so it's a truly horrendous situation. Uh, the only thing that I will say in mitigation of all of this and, and I really think that this is important. And I will again, uh, uh, look, we are first of all, tremendously biased towards negativity. That is, you're never gonna read a, a story that says, you know, 70 years, Sweden hasn't gone to war, right? Because that's a good thing and nobody reads a good thing because why should you, but if tomorrow, Somebody, if, if tomorrow Sweden has a skirmish on the border, you're going to read about it in the front page of the New York Times. Um, and the same thing is true here. There's a great deal of, of serious effort and human desire and negotiations and hope. Um, and good things happen sometimes very surprisingly in the world. The day before the Soviet Union collapsed, nobody thought the Soviet Union was going to collapse. And all of a sudden, all these countries were free overnight. Um, so I am, I am constitutionally hopeful. Uh, also, I think as a religious person, one ought to be. Um, but this is a very, a situation of tremendous suffering and tremendous despair. Um, and I can only say that uh, the sooner it is resolved justly, the better. But, but boy, I, I don't know how to get there. And I'm not sure. Um, that anyone does. And it is complicated, obviously, by all the other geopolitical factors, um, including elections in the United States, that make uh, reaching a solution that much harder. Um, but uh, how's that for, uh, for an inconclusive end? I mean, I could talk a lot more about it, but I think that that's probably uh, adequate for the moment. You're reflecting the state of the world quite adequately. I think that's fair to yeah. say. Thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us. Thank, Thank you, David, for your time. Thank you.